Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. As we come off a very important day in Washington yesterday that was shrouded by so much noise in the political space, in any other world, a trilateral meeting between the United States, Japan, and Philippines that will likely result in a more formal alliance in the South China Sea, an alliance against China, would be front page news. But we've got FISA coming and going. We've got Trump doing this and that. We've got the abortion ruling in Arizona that's taking a lot of attention here. There's almost uh, no time to get to it all. And I was heartened to see the column today uh, by my colleague, Andreas Kluth, reporting uh, for Bloomberg Opinion from here in Washington, D.C. Hail the trilateral chiefs, Biden, Kishida, Marcos. Indeed, this is important and worth your attention. As the president tries to put together a network of alliances that some people are calling a Pacific version of NATO. Andreas is with us now on Balance of Power, and it's great to see you, sir. You talk about the lattice work of alliances, the mini lateral partnerships. It, is it possible to connect the dots on all of them? It's hard. Uh, in fact, I, it, I believe my title made fun of that, like mocked that, because I think it, I said, hail the mini lateral chiefs, you know. But basically what you have is, by my count, three trilaterals and one quadrilateral, Mm -hmm. all overlapping in the Indo-Pacific, all led by the U.S. And if forming what they call, you know, their metaphor now, it's it's, it is a lattice. Uh, What does the lattice replace? It replaces what's emerged since World War II in the Indo-Pacific but not in the Atlantic, which is in the Indo-Pacific, you've had a hub and spoke system. So the U.S. has bilateral alliances with security guarantees with Japan, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Thailand. It, but they, but there was no thought some of these countries were acting independently or in the case of South Korea and Japan were even, even hated each other. And the U.S. has been under Biden trying to bring some order into that and make it, as I said, a lattice, whether whether that works for you or not, we can debate. And of course, one thought that they have in their mind is the other side of the world, which is NATO. 75th anniversary just passed and the and yeah. Biden will host in July, will host this year's NATO summit in Washington, which is this incredibly successful alliance. All alliances are supposed to deter the lattice is supposed to ter- deter China. NATO is supposed to deter Russia, always has done. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a problem in NATO, which is burden sharing. So a lot of the allies are free riding on American defense spending, and Biden wants to prevent yeah. that. And I think if you want to if you want to be kind and generous, he wants to build a new and improved NATO, a NATO 2.0 in the mm-hmm. Indo-Pacific for the what they view as the larger challenge for the next 75 years, which is likely going to be China. Well, let's go a little deeper into that because we heard from the president yesterday as part of that trilateral meeting. And I want to ask you, Andreas, about enforcement. We talked so much about Article 5 in Europe. Listen to what he said about the Indo-Pacific region when he spoke yesterday, and we'll talk about this on the other side. Here's the president. The United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They're ironclad. As I've said before, any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. So, Andreas Kluth, it sounds like there there is an equivalent to Article 5 in the Pacific. Isn't that what he just said? Yes and no. The, the difference... So this defense treaty with the Philippines goes back to the 50s, I believe. It's old. Uh, it, it Mutual defense guarantee. That's what all the treaties I mentioned earlier have. Article yeah. 5 of NATO 
is different. It says one an attack against one is an attack against all. In theory, mm -hmm. it, it obliges all 32, with Sweden now, allies, to come to the defense of any of them. It's only been invoked and once. so the Philippines and Japan would not come to our defense, in other words, if we were attacked? Well, well they're not in NATO. I was saying that was Article 5 in NATO. What he Understood, but I'm trying to discern the difference between these two. Exactly. And so here, the U.S. would come to the defense of the Philippines or of Australia, but Japan wouldn't have to, is not in the treaty. And that's the difference with the lattice and the trilaterals and quadrilaterals. Biden wants, and Japan, a Kishido in this very moving speech to Congress. I, we, maybe we should go into that because I, was, I thought it was powerful. Essentially signaled, we're sharing this burden with you. We would also help, even though Japan has no formal treaty at present with the Philippines, for example. So you see, that's the difference, a bilateral defense guarantee versus mm -hmm. a multilateral. And that's where the minilateral and the attempts come out, that, that the U.S. doesn't want all by itself to defend the Philippines against China. And then... Japan again, you know, North South Korea against North Korea and so forth. So it's yeah. multilateral versus bilateral and the attempt through the lattice, through the minilaterals to bra to 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 have a collective defense in the Indo-Pacific. So there's work to be done here, then obviously. Lots. I'm just trying to get to whatever the next step is. Andreas, if, if Joe Biden can create, to your point, a, a sort of NATO 2.0 in that region, it's gonna involve connecting the dots in all of these partnerships. And I wonder if AUKUS is the starting point for that, knowing that Japan talked about its role as a second pillar. Why not pull yeah. all of these countries into this alliance with the UK and Australia? Wouldn't that be the closest thing to a formal yes. partnership that we could start with? Yes. And in fact, that's sort of the the here inside the beltway. That's the most problem. The Australians have some concerns, but very briefly, AUKUS could expand to become JOKUS or, or and any number of other yes. things. AUKUS has two pillars, two parts. One is simply to get nuclear powered but conventionally armed American submarines to Australia. Um, but the longer term but more interesting part is to is pillar two where the three countries, which are also already three of the five countries in the Five Eyes common spying, you know, spy, spy intelligence network, so they trust each other, mm -hmm. where they would collaborate on producing uh, underwater robot warfare, uh, a quantum warfare, artificial intelligence, basically all the ways you would, f you would win fight and win the next war, uh, which are very costly. And this goes to the burden sharing. They would, from the start, mm -hmm. conceive, build, invest in these methods together, and based on that, yeah. deepen their 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 commitments to each other. And they could pull in other. That could be widened to Japan and then possibly to others in the future. I'm thinking South Korea, the for example. The Alliance. Andreas, thank you so much. I wish we had more time, but I will again point everyone to the column. Hail the trilateral chiefs. And remember this conversation next time we're talking about the South China Sea. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I am Kaylee Lines alongside Joe Matthew in Washington, where the House seems to have done it, Joe, actually mm -hmm. passing a two-year reauthorization yep. of FISA, warrantless surveillance a Warren Amendment that was brought by Andy Biggs did not pass. It was tied yeah. 212, 212. So no shortage of drama on the House floor. But of course, wrapping this up only eats into part of what the House has on its to-do list. Still in question is supplemental funding for aid to U.S. allies, including Ukraine, yes, but also Israel. As mm -hmm. Israel, we understand, is facing down a threat that could be coming at it within the next 48 hours, according to our reporting. Yeah, this is... Uh Really something. It's getting more complex as we approach the weekend, Kaylee. And you reminded us yesterday of uh, the FBI director, Christopher Wray's mm -hmm. warning uh, of uh, a potential terror attack yeah. 
imminently like we saw in Russia. That plays into the conversation around FISA. Now, of course, geopolitics popping on this president as well. These are dangerous times that we're living mm -hmm. in here, and that's why we wanted to have Ian Marlowe join us, Bloomberg News uh, senior reporter covering diplomacy. Ian, it's great to have you with us again on Balance of Power. The next 48 hours are going to tell us a lot here. Bloomberg News is at least anticipating the potential for a direct strike on Israeli soil. How likely is that? Yeah, it seems to be what people are telling uh, sources uh, here and also I think what Israel seems to be bracing for publicly uh, as well as the U.S. The U.S. State Department has warned uh, its own employees not to travel around uh, Israel with this uh, Iran's warning of retaliation sort of sitting out there. And now we're seeing much more uh, alarm that this attack could be imminent. It's not clear exactly what shape it will take. There's talk about uh, Hezbollah militants, which are obviously uh, funded and trained by Iran on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. There's talk of them, you know, raining down missiles or sending drones. Uh, there's even talk of a potential strike emerging from Iranian territory itself. Um, you know, it's not clear how much uh, Israel's Iron Dome and other, uh, you know, missile batteries will be able to take down. So there is a lot of um, alarm, growing concern. Uh, the U.S. is kind of repositioning uh, forces in the region, seems to be moving more uh, assets into the region as well. And I think everyone is just bracing for this right now. Uh, and then, of course, the big question is what comes next? And Israel has uh, yeah. you know, said that they will hit back. Well, especially, Ian, as the U.S. has reiterated time and time again that what they would most like to avoid is a further escalation in the Middle East. But there are different degrees of escalation, surely. How escalatory will it be if it is an Iranian proxy like Hezbollah, as you mentioned, versus Iran itself conducting an attack like this? What are the p potential degrees of ex escalation here? I, I mean, that's a very it's a good question. I think definitely I mean, Hez, Hezbollah militants have already been in direct conflict with Israel. I don't think Israel will draw any distinction um, between, you know, uh, you know, Hezbollah militants necessarily in Iran, per se. They've already hit Iranian assets in Syria and elsewhere uh, as this war has gone on. I think uh, the big thing will be the degree to which this, uh, you know, this attack, if it comes, uh, is successful, you know, what kind of damage it causes, what sort of, um, you know, missiles or else uh, other, uh, you know, mil attack drones or whatever it will be, how much actually gets through, you know, Israeli uh, defenses and, you know, the degree to which any damage is caused will probably shape the Israeli reaction. And I think the big open question is, you know, if it comes from Iran proper and there is, uh, you know, a significant degree of damage or casualties, you know, it, Israel would be forced, uh, I think, in terms of domestic pressure and in terms of its own war aims to to respond. And that was, as you say, one of the U.S. goals since this conflict began uh, has been to avoid that sort of escalation. And we've seen various tit for tat escalations, um, you know, throughout the region in Iraq and Syria, you know, with Lebanon yeah. as this war has dragged on. And none of them have actually, you know, led to that full blown, you know, regional conflict that the U.S. has been trying to avoid. And I think the real worry here is that this sort of response from Iran and an Israeli counter response could then engender that type of, um, you know, regional conflagration that everyone's been trying to avoid. Well, we I suspect we'll be hearing from Israel's ambassador to the United Nations either way. I've only got a minute left here, Ian, but your piece today on the ambassador is really worth talking about here and how strident he has been, the tough words that he's been using uh, to clap back on calls for a ceasefire. Yeah, thank you for highlighting this piece. We had a couple of chances to talk to uh, Gil Adardan, the, uh, the Israeli ambassador to the UN, and he really has personified the Israeli response to critics of the war, which is a sort of uncompromising approach, putting down Israel's critics. You know, Israel has a, a, a very interesting history with the with the UN. It created, you know, it helped create Israel. And, and the ambassador told us in interviews that, you know, that is the, the UN that exists now, where uh, countries vote against Israel constantly, way more than they do against, say, Russia or Iran or Myanmar. Um, it, it, it's not the same United Nations. You know, he, he, he talks about it being utterly politicized, you know, just basically being isolated. And I think his uncompromising approach at the UN, uh, people are saying is sort of alienating potential moderate 
countries in the middle who could be supporting Israel, but who might, you know, who are on the fence, uh, that that sort of behavior and those sorts of words and, and some of the, you know, he's accused, you know, uh, the United Nations of being anti-Semitic. He's called for uh, the chief, uh, you know, Antonio Guterres to step down, to resign over comments he made. Um, and is constantly, you know, saying Hitler would be singing the praises of the UN these days. That kind of language, you know, people are saying is just kind of alienating potential Israeli supporters. And it's been a stance that looks, um, you know, to some observers and critics, particularly a little bit awkward or risky as this conflict has gotten much, much worse, as the death toll has climbed, as we've seen the awful humanitarian situation there. So it, it's a very, uh, I, I just thought he was a very interesting uh, person to look at as this conflict is dragged on yeah. as a way to look at Israel's own view of, of the conflict. Absolutely. Ian Marlowe, thank you so much. And it is a great piece. You can check it out on the terminal and online. Israel's embattled envoy takes on the UN as the Gaza crisis worsens. And of course, Joe, we have heard a lot from President Biden about the Gaza crisis worsening as well. He has had words for Netanyahu mm -hmm. himself as he has continually reminded us. This is what uh, the president had to say most recently about the conversation that he has had with the Israeli prime minister around humanitarian aid. Here he is. I have been very blunt and straightforward with the prime minister as well as his war cabinet, as well as the cabinet. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, Bibi and I had a long discussion. He agreed to do several things that related to, number one, getting more aid, both food and medicine, into Gaza, and reducing significantly the attempts, the civilian casualties in any action taken in the region. We want to have more now on what is happening in the region Region with Kelly Grieco. She is senior fellow with the Reimagining U.S. Grand Strategy Program at the Stimson Center. So, Kelly, great to have you with us. Obviously, we have heard in recent weeks a sharpening of U.S. language around Israel and its policy in Gaza, suggestion that U.S. policy may have to change if they don't see what they want from the Israelis in terms of humanitarian aid, as we just heard the president talk about. But can the U.S. really do that, knowing that potentially... Israel is bracing for an attack from Iran or its proxies within the next 48 hours in Israeli territory. Can the U.S. do both here, or do they really only have one option, and that is to defend Israel if Iran makes this move? Yes, well, thank you for having me. And I think you just captured the essential challenge for U.S. policy right now is that on the one hand, we are increasingly frustrated with the Israelis and putting more pressure on them to move towards some kind of a ceasefire arrangement. But this as potential escalation with Iran is limiting our room for maneuver with that. Um, as you said, you can't really have it both ways. Um, if we're going to embrace defending Israel, standing by Israel, if there is an attack, it will limit our ability to put pressure on Israel to also accept a ceasefire. Kelly, can we just slow down a minute here? It's great to have you back. We wanted to talk to you specifically today about all of this. We're talking about the potential for direct conflict between Iran and Israel. We have long heard that that's World War III. What do you think? You know, I have to say, I have a, 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 you know, my stomach is um, hurts right now thinking about this. Um, you know, it's hard to say. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but after 20 years of the U.S. military being actively involved in the Middle East in, during my lifetime, I'm the most anxious today about what is going to happen this weekend um, and in the coming week in terms of this escalation. Because I think, as you said, if, is, if Iran does elect for the most escalatory option, which is a direct strike on Israel from Iranian soil, there is a really increased likelihood that this is going to very quickly become a regional war. Would the U.S. get involved in a regional war like that, Kelly, would this potentially mean American troops back on the ground? Well, I think there are two questions around that um, that would need to be answered first to really know, which is the first one would be how the Iranians conduct the strike. So they have publicly said that they hold us responsible for um, the strikes um, that Israel conducted in Damascus, even though we've said that we were not involved and did not know about them. And so I think there is one question is, would the Iranians actually strike U.S. targets at the same time that they strike Israel itself? That would be one question. If that happens, certainly it would draw us in. And then I think the second one would be what the, the attack on Israel looks like, how extensive it is, what kind of damage it does and destruction. And if it is 
so large and so escalatory, the United States may feel that it has no other choice but to assist mm. Israel in providing for its defense, and that could potentially draw us in. Kelly, the commander of U.S. Central Command, General Eric Carrilla, is in Israel right now. The U.S. sent him there. The Pentagon dispatched him to be able to advise in person and in real time. What is he telling them? Mm. Yes. Um, I mean, I think it's one thing that's worth noting is that he has been regularly visiting Israel um, during this war. Uh, so that's it's not entirely unusual. I would think that he's actually talking a lot about what they're planning to do if there's a direct strike on Israel, what kind of response um, they would, they're would they considering. I think there would have to be a lot of concern that if there is some kind of strike, even if it's very limited against Israel, that the Israelis will respond in a massive way and potentially directly strike Iran. And at that point, um, it's going to be really hard to get these parties to stand down. Kelly, can you just, especially given your areas of expertise, tell us how equipped Israel is not only potentially to conduct a retaliatory, retaliatory strike, if you will, but also defense-wise to withstand a potential attack like this, knowing that we don't actually know what form, if at all, this will happen in. How strong are the is the Iron Dome, our Israeli defense forces, to withstand it from wherever it comes from? Yes, I mean, the Israelis have excellent air and missile defense systems. Uh, I mean, you know, that should obviously be acknowledged. I think the issue is that any kind of air and missile defense system can eventually be swamped, saturated by sheer numbers mm -hmm. of incoming targets. So if the Iranians were to elect to uh, um, strike Israel, if they make these volleys with missiles and drones large enough, they have the potential to leak through, um, to be able to overwhelm these systems. Kelly, it's great to have you back. Kelly Grieco, senior fellow with the Reimagining U.S. Grand Strategy Program at the Stimson Center. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. We have learned many times, Joe, if at first you don't succeed, perhaps you try, 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 try <laughs> sure. again, whether it's the FISA vote that didn't succeed until the fourth time or yeah. whether it's attempting to forgive student loans. You tried to do it in a broad based fashion. If you're President Biden, the Supreme True. Court strikes it down and instead yeah. you try again in smaller increments. And once again, we're getting more increments today. Another seven point four billion dollar in billion dollars in federal student debt mm -hmm. going to be. Relieved. I like the way you did that. I feel like we all have second chances. Right. Maybe that's the case for Joe Biden. He's doing the same thing for the border, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be his third swing at that one. Try, try again with our panel. Rick Davis is with us, of course, Bloomberg Politics contributor, longtime Republican strategist, joined by Democratic strategist Pat Dennis. He's the president of American Bridge 21st Century. Pat, this matter of forgiving student debt has been a sticky one for Joe Biden and a lot of young people uh, feel like he did simply did not make good on a promise, regardless of his try, try again, and the fact that the court, Supreme Court, is the one that stopped it. How important will this be as a tool for him in the campaign? It's important. I mean, it's important that voters see you not giving up on delivering on your campaign promises, delivering for voters. You know, you're going to see a ton of complaining from Republicans who are going to sue to try to stop this. They're going to try to, you know, prevent this debt from being forgiven, life-changing amounts of debt in some cases. And, you know, if you show me a powerful Republican who opposes this measure, I'll show you somebody who got a PPP loan um, forgiven, either them themselves or, you know, their biggest mm -hmm. donors. So it seems to me like Never we're not so much arguing well. about like whether debt should be forgiven. It should be about uh, whose. Well, Rick, the words Pat just used there, the idea that you need to be seen not giving up on something, continuing to try, is that what this is really about? Not so much the outcome as the effort if you're a presidential candidate, or do you need outcomes for when voters go to the polls in November and think, okay, what has he actually done for me? Yeah, I, I think it's a good question. I think politically you want outcomes. You want that money hitting the street before election day. None of these funds will actually make their way into uh, I say funds, uh, reliefs will make its way into the balance sheet of most of these folks before Election Day. So it's you have to consider it mostly rhetoric. 
Um, we know that the courts, not Republicans, have had a lot of problems with uh, mission creep by this administration around these kinds of debt relief efforts uh, on the part of the administration. So that's going to play out in the courts, regardless of what the politics of the situation is. And and look, I mean, it's kind of a naked grab for youth votes. Uh, you know, they're and it's not the 18 to 25 year olds. They they're the ones who are generating the debt right now. It's mostly the 30 to 55 year olds who still have been carrying around a lot of this debt for a long time. And I don't think anybody disagrees that student debt burdens uh, uh, are not good for the economy, but it, it's an incredibly unfair uh, approach, which is those people who carried the most debt, not the ones who paid off their loans, not the ones who mm -hmm. couldn't get a loan and didn't go to college and went to maybe community college or didn't go to you know, you know know anything other than a high school education. What's in it for them? They're taxpayers too, they're funding this. And so I think, you know, Pat's right, It's it, the issue isn't, uh, whether you're doing it, it's who's it go to? And right now it's going to mm. a group of people who, you know, it's just not in the doesn't pass the fairness quotient by American standards. Mm. Well, it's interesting, Pat, uh, when we talk about other people paying for stuff here, because there's a story uh, today by Axios that Joe Biden actually used campaign money. It was DNC cash, one and a half million dollars to pay for lawyers to pay for legal bills and the special counsel's probe into his handling of classified documents. Remembering he spent a lot of time criticizing Donald Trump for using campaign money to pay for his attorney's fees. And I know we're talking about one and a half million versus in excess of $50 million, but it's these little things. It's partly the reason why people aren't talking about Donald Trump's classified documents case because Joe Biden got one of his own, realizing there may not be a moral equivalency here. How tough is this headline? When you see something like this in, in leaving Joe Biden incapable or maybe not credible in some of his attacks against Donald Trump. Yeah, it's classic whataboutism, right? You do one one thousandth of something that totally makes sense, but kind of rhymes in some way with something egregious <laughs> that Trump did. And all of a sudden, you know, people are jumping uh, down your throat about it. This is the kind of thing where there's absolutely no equivalence between uh, what the DNC did hear some like, you know, routine legal bills. You know, I I run a super PAC. I wish I could get legal bills down to a million and a half sometimes. But, uh, you know, and what Trump has done, which is frequently deceive his donors, um, you know, folks who thought they were giving to win elections or folks who thought they were, you know, giving based on big lie rhetoric. And he just took that money and put it in his own pocket for his own personal legal bills. There's no equivalence here. Well, Pat, it, it all speaks to this idea that there is legal trouble surrounding the former president as he is campaigning against Biden in the general election. And really, it's going to come to the forefront of attention on Monday when his trial, the first ever criminal trial of a former president, begins in New York. It could last six to eight weeks, but realistically, we're talking before the convention here. This could be wrapped up and he could. There is a chance he ends up a convicted felon. What would change for the Biden campaign at that point if he's convicted or if he's not? Yeah, and it's important people don't forget, like Michael Cohen went to jail over this exact thing, not something similar, this exact issue. Uh, it's really serious for him. And look, Republicans will do everything they can to cover up for him, to act like this is no big deal, to act like this is some kind of partisan witch hunt. But this is the legal system. This is the legal system that sent Michael Cohen to jail when he was Trump's enemy at the time. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's a big deal. I'm not going to talk about the who's up, who's down of uh, a major candidate uh, being found guilty of felonies. I think we can all agree um, that that's not good. But ultimately, like Republicans are going to have to decide exactly how far down this doom loop they're going to follow him. Well, that's right. Rick, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this. Joe Biden having the DNC pay for his attorneys. Does that not sound like Donald Trump. I, you can talk about equivalency, but perception's reality. Well, I mean, this is all self-inflicted pain. I mean, the, the campaign's finance chairman goes out and says, we don't spend money on legal bills. And then the DNC in their filings shows clearly that they spent money over a million bucks for Bob Bauer, who was representing the president in his uh, you know, documents case. Uh, you know, so that's exactly what they did. And if they just kept their mouth shut and didn't make a big deal of it, it wouldn't be such a Big deal, but don't you know? Don't cast stones into that glass house if yours is still pretty thin itself. Um, look, I mean, I think the issue of those documents cases with the 
um, with the sensitive and confidential information that Trump had and, and Biden had were handled differently by each individual. And I think, you know, the president handled his more responsibly. But then don't go lying about, um, you know, whether or not you spent DNC money on it because you did. And 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 just come clean. It, that's what American voters want. They want someone who they, they don't really care whether you use the, the, the money at the DNC for this. What they care about is you, you, you weren't really straight with them about it. And I think that could be a breakaway moment for this campaign, you know, Biden, you know, because there's no chance that Donald Trump's ever going to be straight with anything or or apologize. And, and, and Biden does have the opportunity to be running a campaign that actually is more transparent and honest with the press and with the voters. So, Rick, essentially what you're saying is, well, sometimes the former president can say things that are outright untruthful and either people believe him or decide that it's just Trump being Trump, that Biden is not held to that same standard, or rather Trump is not being held to the same standard Biden is. Yeah, I just don't think there's an expectation that you're ever going to get a truthful statement out of Trump. So he kind of gets a pass, right? Go lie all day long and the press doesn't even report it. You know, but Biden holds himself out as being the truth teller, right? And that's a very good place to be in this election, I think. You know, you want to own that ground. You want to be the fact-based campaign. So you just got to be a little more careful with how you then represent yourself when things like this happen. It would have been absolutely fine for the Biden campaign to say, yeah, we probably should have told the press that, you know, we were using, you know, over a million bucks to pay for our bills. I don't think anybody would have cared at that stage, and it would have drawn a Mm -hmm. contrast to, you know, the the kind of transparency that the Trump campaign's given their donors versus those that are being given by the DNC. I guarantee you the DNC donors were happy to do that. It wasn't an egregious amount, uh, but, you know, they never gave them a chance because they, they really didn't, you know, come straight with them. All right. Rick Davis, Republican strategist, and Pat Dennis, our Democratic strategist, joining us today from American Bridge. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I will be heading to New York Mm. on Monday for the beginning of a historic proceeding, the first criminal trial of a former U.S. President Joe Donald Trump, unless we see... A delay he's asking for. Yeah, right. We'll go on trial in New York in the hush money case involving Stormy Daniels. Yeah, we feel like we've done this already. Uh, Obviously, people have gone through this case. They've heard about the hush Mm -hmm. money payments. They remember Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, Mm -hmm. Lanny Davis on TV every night. But this is the actual trial. And when you're up there on Monday, they're going to start assembling a jury. And based on this questionnaire, uh, Kaylee, jury selection in itself could be wild. Yeah, they need to find a dozen jurors, and they are going to be essentially judging someone who, yes, is their peer, but also is a former president of the United States, current presidential candidate, someone with incredible name recognition. Yes. So they're going to be asked things like, do they have political, moral, intellectual, or religious beliefs or opinions that may slant their approach to this case? It's mm-hmm. going to be tough work to actually identify yeah. these dozen individuals, and you need the alternates as well. And that is where we begin with Nick Ackerman, a former Watergate prosecutor who is joining us now. Nick, it's always great to have you on the show. We will get to jury selection in a moment, but first, do you see any possible chance that this is delayed and this doesn't in fact start on Monday the 15th? Boy, I don't see it. I know Trump is probably trying every trick in the book, but I just don't see there being a delay. He tried three times this week and was denied by the appeals court all three times. That said, we'll start Monday. And I was just referencing the questionnaire for jurors. Nick, what is this going to be like? They're going to be asking people if they have truth social accounts, (laughs) among other things. Everybody in New York knows about this story. Is it possible to find and assemble a fair jury? Oh, definitely. You will be surprised how many people in New York have not paid attention to this story or paid attention Hmm. to the fact of this case. It never ceases to amaze me. I've had other jury selections in high profile cases uh, where I thought for sure it would be difficult, but it never is. And it wasn't difficult to find two juries uh, in the E. Jean Carroll case. Uh, And that didn't take too long. The real key here is whether or not the individuals who are going to be on that jury can be fair and impartial, even if they know who the defendant is and they have some rough idea about the case. 
Well, so let's get into the details of the case then, Nick, because obviously what we're talking about here is 34 counts of falsifying business records. In New York, typically this would be a misdemeanor. The reason why this is a a felony in this case is because Alvin Bragg, the district attorney, is arguing that this was used uh, in violation of election law because this was done during the 2016 election, allegedly. How hard is this case going to be to prosecute? Sure. It's not going to be just on election law. It's not just federal. It's not just it's also state election law uh, and it's also tax violations. So what Alvin Bragg has to prove is that there was an intent to commit those crimes. Uh, And it's not that unusual. I mean, this is a pretty run of the mill Mm -hmm. charge that's made on the state level. Uh, And the fact that it's made into a felony is not that unusual either. So you think this case is easier for the prosecution than than the defense? Well, much easier. I mean, they've got two uh, cooperating witnesses. Uh, It's not just Michael Cohen, his former lawyer. Uh, It's also uh, David Pecker, who was the owner of the National Enquirer, who together met with Donald Trump to come up with this catch and kill scheme, whereby they would try and look for stories that were derogatory of Donald Trump Uh, and make payoffs like they did with Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal uh, to keep those stories from ever seeing the light of day uh, before the presidential election in 2016. I know this trial is supposed to last six weeks. Uh, That's the estimation. Nick, if jury selection becomes uh, painful, uh, maybe it won't, in your view, as they talk about everything from QAnon to Antifa, But if that became a more protracted process, does the trial creep into two months? What's your thought now on duration? Well, it's very hard to tell. I really don't think jury selection is going to be that long. Uh, You talk about Antifa and QAnon. Um, The fact of the matter is jurors are going to have to express certain knowledge about these areas. It all goes to whether they can be fair and impartial. Uh, The um, both the defense and the government have the opportunity to raise with the judge uh, disqualifications of jurors for cause. Uh, But on top of that, they each have what are known as preemptory challenges, which means that they can essentially uh, dismiss a certain number of jurors. Uh, Each side has those uh, because they just don't feel comfortable with them for whatever reason, as long as it's not based on a racial or ethnic reason. Nick, something else I want to bring up is the gag order that the judge has put into place uh, for this trial. It has actually been expanded to include the judge himself and his family, but also uh, other officials of the court and other potential likely witnesses like Stormy Daniels or Michael Cohn, who we've talked about. And on True Social on Wednesday, Trump said that those two are two sleaze bags who have with their lies and misrepresentations cost our country dearly. Where is the line of what violates this? gag order well, no doubt in my mind that violates the gag order uh, I, this is a case that absolutely needs a gag order it's like an organized crime case to the extent that people's lives witnesses in particular uh, family of the court are really put in jeopardy it's not so much by donald trump himself uh, but what he says to some of his supporters who are clearly uh, a bit unhinged Uh, We saw that happen in North Carolina, where uh, an individual showed up with a loaded gun in an FBI office. Uh, Ultimately, he was killed in the process. Uh, We saw this happen in Utah. Uh, There is a real present danger here that what Trump says is going to have a real life impact on the safety of of witnesses, uh, jurors uh, and court personnel. Um, So I think the judge is going to handle this somehow. We'll see. I think the real problem is that most all of these judges are afraid to put Trump in jail, uh, which they would do with any other defendant who violated this kind of a gag order. Uh, And they're afraid to do that until such time as a jury of 12 people uh, convict him of a crime. Now, he's got other possibilities here in terms of how he could punish him, either through fines uh, or through other parts of the trial, which... um, You know, he could wind up giving a charge uh, on this issue that would not be too helpful to Donald Trump. Um, What's so unusual here is in all my years of experience, I've never seen a defendant go this far attacking people involved in the case. 
uh, particularly the judge. I mean, that's the last person you'd ever want to attack, because at the end of the day, that judge is going to have total discretion as to whether the defendant goes to jail, gets probation, whatever that sentence is, uh, you don't want, uh, if it's my client, I would not want him doing anything uh, that in any way undermine the judge's ability to look at him um, in a complete void of any kind of threats like Donald Trump is making. Nick Ackerman, it's always great to have you back. We'll be thinking about this talk when the trial starts on Monday. Of course, former assistant U.S. attorney and former special Watergate prosecutor with us. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.